according to what you're doing, was such a mediocre me. But let's not talk about that. If we ignore the many, 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 many pitfalls I faced this year, we can at least agree that it was a good time for media, right guys? Right? I mean, come on, look at all this stuff. In fact, there was so much stuff, I didn't get to talk about everything I wanted to this year. Laziness, busyness, pick my excuse. But today, I atoned for my sins by doing a wrap-up of everything from 2023. From what I experienced, at least. I know I'm missing, like, a ton of things this year. I haven't even watched Godzilla Minus One. He hasn't watched Godzilla Minus One. Uh, how am I a true cinephile? A waterfile? And that's not even getting to the stuff I experienced this year, like Lord of the Rings and Silent Hill and Sliss Gabby but that's for a different day. I love you, baby. Without further ado, this was the rest of 2023. The Monkey King! This was a movie as mixed as my nuts, which is very. I like eating them, all right? They taste good. Visually, it's spectacular, especially with all the effects and presentation of flair to it. There's just a lot of cool stuff I recommend watching the movie just for. It jingles those effects like a treat that I can't stop eating. Oh, oh yeah, this is so good! The main issue is that the story's only okay. I got no issues with Monkey. I love him. It's a good balance of making this guy a jerk to everyone except for the audience. So he ends up being funny, and that's the one I want to stream on the roof, So, you know what? Good job. I just feel like this movie goes into that trope of unlikable guy learns to like others because of child. And, I don't know, I find that a mixed bag. It's not my favorite trope out there. The kid isn't too bad, but when you mix in a liar reveal plot, it does feel we're trekking on a familiar path here. There's some nuances on how the Monkey King responds to others and disappointments that got me thinking, like, I don't know, something about him being slightly disappointed like he was expecting this to happen? I don't know, I kinda like that detail, but I don't think there's enough here to really give me that substance that I'm looking for. We're just mainly going through a quest that's fun enough, you know, I like the set pieces and stuff like that, there's not a boring part in the movie, but it feels like this movie could've been so much more. It feels like this story is struggling to be entirely original in terms of deviating from the original tale, yet it feels like it does want to pull what made that original tale work in the first place, and I feel like you're straddling between two lines that you shouldn't straddle with. It feels like the story goes in a direction that it shouldn't go based on everything that we've seen. I don't know, it just feels jarring to me, and you can tell it's trying to pull from that original tale, which made more sense in my opinion. I prefer it to be like Hercules where it goes completely off the grid, or be like Moses where it sticks and enhances the original intent of the tale, because we get this weird middle ground where it makes me feel disappointed, especially with the ending that lost more steam than boiling water. So with the good and the bad, it's really hard to call this movie bad when we get a damn decent villain song. No joke, this has been my playlist for months. Help me! Ooh, ooh, damn, this is cinema, baby! Ooh, cinema is back! Uh, this, this, this might be my favorite movie of the entire year? Not the best, I'll admit, but man, it's charming as all hell. And heaven too, from an art style that embraces the imperfect ugly nature that we see in city life to the way the movie manages to feel fresh by twisting and stretching a nearly 50 years mythos to suit the story that suits it best. I acknowledge that some of the movie does have its fair share of cliches and half duns, but this movie was tailor made for me, so it'd be rude to call it anything but great. There's a clear, authentic teenage voice that really puts emphasis on that above all else, since I feel that one or more of these words are given more emphasis depending on the series or movie, you know? But here, it's unabashedly teenage. You know a movie is good when you have a great villain that you dread that isn't the Shredder, and then that makes me realize Oh no! Time for the most deadliest and most daunting antagonist to appear in the sequel! Man, too angry to die! I... I thought you were dead. I'm impressed that I actually have the chance to talk about it here, of all places. A project that was considered dead suddenly getting revived and finished? That's like if my shadow and me got canned and then revived. It's unheard of, and it's the prettiest zombie movie I've met to boot. 
there's a unique blend of futuristic medieval going on here to serve as a backdrop for two lovable dorks. I love these guys. Blackheart is so earnest with his intent, and I feel so bad for him. Well, Nomona is just his scheming little daughter. Like, mwah! Oh, winning combo right there. I really like how they tackle government conspiracies and how they're willing to keep the status quo even at the risk of self-imploding. The villain especially. Like, good job guys, yeah. My only real gripe is, yeah, the animation is kind of a downgrade of what we could have gotten, which I feel isn't really that fair for the people working behind the movie since it wasn't in their hands and it'd be dumb to pretend like it was. Just makes me a bit sad of what we could have gotten, but that's more Disney's fault. And that makes me more happy to see Disney kind of fail, so yeah, you kind of deserve it. Except for the artists working there, I really hope you guys are doing well and I'm sorry for your movies uh, bombing. And the other criticism is that characters besides these three are lackluster as a result. I do feel like the romantic interest does get sidelined pretty bad since he does have an interesting conflict, but we just don't get to explore that as heavily as our plucky duo and the conspiracy they unravel. Good stuff though. Wish the people who worked on this the best. And Disney can go jump off a bridge. What are you doing? Crack? You know what you're getting into when you go to watch Cocaine Bear on the big screen? An absolute ride! It takes place in 1985. The first people killed are a couple named Olaf and Elsa. Famed character actor Margot Martindale is here and is given the most gruesome death ever for seemingly no reason. She's not an evil character or anything. Like, I got no analysis on why this movie is fun. It just is. You turn your brain off and you see a bear doing a whole brick of cocaine. Because that's what Cocaine Bear is all about, baby. I hate you. I fucking hate you. <laughs> oh, now this is a roller coaster movie. Where after a short intro, we just get set piece after set piece after set piece. It really feels like this movie would make for a good game. Which makes sense since this is a movie based on video game. Chris Pratt is fine, but Jack Black as Bowser? Oh, yeah, perfect, yeah. perfect, yeah. Peaches is one of the two movie songs of the year that only matter. Yeah, sure, the movie is as shallow as a kid's pool, but did we really need that depth in the first place? It's Mario. Not to say that we shouldn't demand for a better movie, and I feel that Mario himself was kinda done dirty. I would've made it so Mario is just that static, good, helpful fella, and we see how that positive outlook changes everyone for the better. So basically, Paddington 2. Because wowzers, that movie is in triple S tier, baby! Either way, you're here for the fan service ride. So why not sit down and enjoy that ride? <laughs> this was my sister's most anticipated movie of the year. And it sure was. Yes, it never does any of the death screen jump scares from the games. Neither do you see Foxy run up to you. So uh, I'm gonna dock some points because that sucks. And so FNAF is a movie that doesn't really work as a horror movie. Every other Blue Moon, it does that somewhat well, but you do lose what made the game special when translating it to a different medium. But honestly, I didn't come here for that. What I got was the best comedy of the year. There's so much goofy stuff to make fun of here, effortlessly funny moments. It's a movie that understands its meme status and yet doesn't force that into your mouth in an exhausting, desperate way. But instead, it delivers cam. It takes itself seriously enough to not completely be meta and annoying and bad, but all those little aspects add up in the long run. The animatronics look so good. What do you expect from the guys who made Sesame Street? This lawyer appears in like two scenes and he's the best character. This is a fact. I am the law and I say this guy is the best character. So, uh, yeah. Like, if you can have MatPat appear and genuinely be funny to see him in said movie, then the movie can't be that bad. We all okay with using ancient Eldritch magics? Sure, why not? Uh, I didn't watch this movie, but my sister said it was good and it was epic and a child died in that movie, so I guess thumbs up? Yay! <laughs> this is one of those movies that frustrated me with some aspects, but it was fine. I liked a lot of the concepts and the overall execution, the directions they went about these two lost siblings split at an early age, 
I really liked a lot of the characters here. The visuals made my brain go, ooh, especially the clouds. Like, ooh, kind of candy clouds. I like, I like it, I like it, yeah. It does embody those old fairy tales, and it made for a comfy watch. It was just relaxing to watch through, man. That does mean it stumbles towards predictability, and especially the climax loosens its grip on me. Also, damn, one way to ruin a fairy tale story, ironically enough, is to include a narrator. Unless the writing is super pleasant, or straight up is the one for word girl, you cannot convince me that narrators are necessary for movies, and this one made me take a stance on this debate. I'm a beautiful- I put this movie on as a joke to be honest, but I guess the joke was on me because I ended up growing pretty well with this. I was worried for a second of whether this was actually gonna be a good Adam Sandler movie or a crazy dice. God damn, I got lucky. Visually, it doesn't look all that distinct or impressive, almost generic to a point which I know might turn off some people, but there's some quirks that shine through. I'm honestly surprised at the amount of heart that the story has, stemming from a lizard realizing he's at death's door, and so accidentally makes an impact on his school kids' lives. It was super sweet, and damn it, I really like that. There's this way this movie makes me laugh at Lizard saying, Sadness is a lie, pussy! To becoming a genuine heartwarming message about listening to others. There are bits of tonal whiplash, and the songs can be hit or miss, though I personally believe they click into the main story pretty decently. I'm no music man though, so don't get mad at how dumb I am, which I already know. And it's none, because mom called me a smart boy. You don't matter to me! Laser Hawk is a surprisingly gay show that explores the cyberpunk setting pretty well. It's so surreal to have a remix like this, where it takes things like Assassin's Creed, Tom Clancy, and Rayman, and fit them under the context of a singular universe owned by a corporatocracy. I know I didn't say that right, shut up. This is a show where I'm actually concerned who's gonna die and who isn't since they make it clear from the get-go that no one might live to the next episode. And the little nods in the 90s were fun, if a bit jarring. The way that we have some genuine heart and arcs, even for Rayman of all characters, yeah, Rayman surprisingly has one of the best arcs in the show. A thumbs up, Netflix, you actually did something right. Good on you. Please don't be you and let this show get another season. Pretty please? Fred makes you fat. P.H. Fat. Uh. This and Laserhawk are both competing to see who can be gayer, and the nominations are strong. Damn, bro, this reaffirmed my stance, but I do not want to see straightforward adaptations anymore. Like, come on, this is so cool! Acting as a sort of continuation for the original comics, it celebrates the concept of Scott Pilgrim by him dipping out by the end of the first episode. Something I did not see coming because I didn't know anything about Scott Pilgrim going in. So, uh... So by the end of the first episode, I was bouncing in my seat. I like that this was way more slice of life than I thought it was gonna be, so since I always saw the more bombastic side of the franchise through discussions and overall vibe. There's a ton more that goes into the evil exes and how they're developed, how Ramona and other characters are developed, and so on and so forth. I had to get props to that one episode where they're fighting at the rental store and they get teleported into the VHSs. Like, that's just great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, that humor fits like a perfectly fitted shirt. And that shirt says, Scott Pilgrim. Like, why do you want to see the comic, but animated, when we can get stuff like this? If you want to see Scott Pilgrim so bad, read! It's all there, read! I can build that now! Uh, Zelda is the game that gets gooder and gooder, even though I still have not been in it as of recording this. And I love all the nuances of the mechanics. I feel like the puzzles work better since we have to take into account the physics and how they affect the world with all these mechanics that are super nuanced. A lot better than ice. You know, I don't know, like, ice was really the best we could do in the first game? I, I feel like I remember a ton more than I did with Breath of the Wild, and I still have not beaten that game either, and I played that game for much, much longer. It's just fun to explore a remix version of a world we've seen before, seeing what changed since last time and how characters have been doing since then. It's like meeting beloved relatives after so many years. They're just as fun as I left them, just a bit different. I can't say anymore because I beat like only one dungeon and probably only 2% of the game from what I've seen, uh, so yeah. Pikmin. 
four of those. Oh yeah! Now that game, that game was good. I beat that thing in like two weeks. I still need to get back into it. I only played it once, which is a travesty because the game. Damn! I love being a little guy telling even more little guys to do things. The rewind feature is such an underrated tool to understanding the maps and finding the best method to getting things done. I especially love the challenge rooms. It's just a bite-sized ROM to get the most you can get. And when you beat the game and you get even more games, including a remixed version of maps you played with all of our under a strike 30 day time limit like the original game? Bringing back a ton of fan favorite enemies? Yes! Yeah, water race! Water race! If this was the cause of Ballman going into the extinction, then goddammit, it was a necessary sacrifice because this is one of the best games of the year. To be fair, I don't own a PS5 or rich enough to afford games, so I could be missing out on things like Spider-Man 2, Baldur's Gate, Super Mario Wonder, Pizza Tower, Hi-Fi Rush, Spore Spoken, that, that could be a great game, I don't know. But Pikmin 4? It would probably still be up there, regardless if I did play those games. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, technically, I saw The Boy in the Heron, but I still need to compound my thoughts since... I only saw the movie like two days ago and I don't really know how I feel about that. You know, it's like a movie that you really need to let that linger. I can't really just type a review up like I can with any other piece. So yeah, that, that's it. See you next time where I put on my big boy pants and I tell you guys what movies you should be watching. Which is none because we all know that movies are dead. Ooh.